As I stand in this room, I can't help but feel a connection to history. Who lived here? What were their experiences like? What noises could be heard? I have no choice but to resort to my imagination, to form my own perception of what life was like hundreds of years ago. We navigate through life by reflecting on our memories, by reasoning, and by making decisions. It's these processes that we classify as our human experience. An experience which is constantly built on senses, the ability to see, the ability to smell, and the ability to touch. In fact, there are specific areas of the brain dedicated to carrying out these functions, and this is precisely where our job plays a role. Understanding these functions through data collected from the brain itself. Yet our experience of the world is subjective, so personal that these processes come to us naturally. We tend to forget the complexity of what goes on backstage, behind closed doors, the complexity of the subconscious. Through applied neuroscience, we begin to get a glimpse into this very important part of our world that would otherwise be completely invisible to us. But can the brain alone make the invisible visible? I'm skeptical. Neurobiology is an important piece of the puzzle, but this lens doesn't give us a complete picture of the entire story. Every one of us was born into a unique body, family, and culture, and our experiences are the product of the dynamic relationship of all these things, just like wine. Grapes picked from this vineyard 12 years ago transformed into a singular bottle of wine. If we were to study the physical properties of the wine as it exists today, we'd miss the most important ingredients from which this wine came to be. Like the climate, the minerals in the soil, the nearby flowers and trees, even the age of the wine barrels in which these grapes fermented will affect the way that the wine will eventually taste. Grapes grow and transform in unique ways due to so many different factors just like our brains, our evolutionary origins, the families we're born into, our cultural communities that we reside in, all create and contribute to the complexity of who we are. And yet, there must be a way to navigate that sea of complexity. We must find an answer to all of those questions that our customers and partners come to us with. Those complex, deep questions about the relationship between humans and food. How do you go about finding that answer? A long time ago, we realized neuroscience alone wouldn't be enough. It's much like trying to navigate a never-changing landscape, like this one around me now, a landscape of sand dunes. Do you really want to go about that landscape with a predetermined map, something that tells you a trajectory that is going to be impossible to apply? Or would you rather go for a direction and maybe switch to searching for a compass? Well, we have searched and found a compass. That compass for us is what we call cultural neuroscience. We believe with cultural neuroscience, we can seek those answers to complex questions. We can look into the depth of multi-layered factors. And this is where you need to put together a series of lenses, not just one through which you're trying to interpret reality, more, more lenses. One of brain data and the lens of emotions, the lens of food, and ultimately the lens of culture. That compass to us is a way to say we refuse to go down the rabbit hole of the obsession for deterministic control. We all have this deep-seated desire for control. 
It stems from our need to define our answers and also be in charge of our personal narrative. But why is that? Because our choices and preferences are often shaped by reasons we may be unaware of. But what if I told you that your brain electrical activity can tell a completely different story about your emotions and your level of attention compared to your subjective feedback? And you may be wondering, why is that? That's because most of your choices you're unaware of. Many of our impulsive choices are driven by emotions. Our habits are formed through repetition. I often wonder, why do I eat what I do? Growing up in an Indian family, living in Dubai, studying in the UK, and now working in Italy, how has this shaped my perception of food? This is why it is worth us investigating the mechanisms which go on in the minds of individuals while they're engaging in experiences, experiences which are essential to our survival, like the experience of food. In our research, we evaluate the brain's responses to certain textures, flavors, and ingredients, providing a holistic vision of human interaction with food. Food builds worlds. Our eating habits are shaped by our cultures, the places we live, our genetics, and even our beliefs. Food was at the beginning of every civilization and is the basis of the stories that we grew up with, even to this day. What we eat touches us in so many different dimensions of our lives that it's a topic of serious interest in both the sciences and the humanities. I've personally tried to study food all throughout my life. First as the child of my mother, who's a brilliant cook of Iranian cuisine. Then as a young neuroscientist in school, studying the effects of a shared communal meal on recovery from depression. And in most recently, I found myself as a professional cook in a fine dining Italian kitchen. If there's one thing that I've noticed throughout all of my experiences, it's that all of these worlds studying food in unique ways are making brilliant discoveries. And yet, I've also noticed that they are almost never talking to each other. We are trying to change that. To understand human experience more fully, we study food through the prism of cultural neuroscience, how our stories and our bodies interact. We believe that by studying food's effects on the mind and the brain, we can begin to bridge the gap between our personal and societal needs and bring forth a sustainable future grounded in a simple truth, that we all eat to nourish, flourish, survive, and celebrate. One of my earliest life memories is a skeleton shed on the night sky in a cornfield in the middle of the summer, a light bulb dangling, and me sitting and eating this huge ripe watermelon slice. And then I very distinctively remember the silhouette of my father in front of a fire, a spit roasting, fog swirling around the trees in the garden. I can't help but thinking how much of those rituals, which were so far beyond nutrition and were nurturing celebration, have created who I am today. So if I were given a choice, would I give up that identity, all of those memories? Would you? In this day and age, we're often told that food systems need to change to save the planet around us, to save us as a species. But how catastrophic do you think it would be if there was only one system that was proposed to us, one for all humanity, erasing and throwing away all those cultural memories across the board? This is precisely where the notion of food humanism comes into play. 
We believe that there is not going to be a leap forward without really embracing the nature of what food means for humans. So there is no food humanism in the future without cultural neuroscience. And cultural neuroscience is so relevant to this equation because it's the very door that is gonna be unlocking the memory emotionally, neurologically, biologically, and socially of who we are as humans, as diverse as we are on all the planet. And so we believe this is the time to ask the right questions. A lot of people are not, we're trying to. And we would like to really encourage all of you out there to be asking yourself this question. How will we keep it human?